Hi, my name is Mark Davis, and with me is Anne-Marie Apple, and we are the chairs of the CLDR committee. Uh, CLDR stands for the Common Locale Data Repository, and it is one of the three main projects of the Unicode Consortium. I note that we're not speaking on behalf of our employers in this presentation. So the three main projects, uh, which you'll know about if you've seen some of the previous videos, are the Unicode Encoding, which supports more than a thousand languages, and in terms of the characters and the properties and behavior of those characters. The properties and behavior are just as important as the many characters because they specify how characters behave and interact with one another. So you can think of those properties and behavior as the instruction manual for how to put characters together. CLDR itself supplies language dependent data for software internationalization. And ICU supplies the internationalization code libraries that build on CLDR, the Unicode encoding, and the character properties and behavior. As you can see from this slide, uh, these are widely used. Uh, every operating system uses them. Uh, apps use them either through the operating system or directly. They're used by many programming languages and then a whole host of other purposes like databases. So let's see how pervasive this data is if we take a look at a Google search page, for example. Uh, here we'll see examples of query normalization on the name where it's the search query can be both case insensitive and accent insensitive as appropriate for the language. Then if you look at the stats, there's number formatting and duration formatting. On the knowledge panels, there's date formatting, including the range here. Also units for locale, including unit conversion. For here, it's in meters, but if you were doing this in American English, you would have feet and inches. Also uh, another date range. Uh, one other example here is in the recency for results. You can see the relative time formatting two days ago. All of these are powered by CLDR. So CLDR also powers all major operating systems and platforms. The first uh, screenshot is Windows, where you can see examples of date preferences. Then we move on to iPad OS, where the languages are listed at the top with both their native and English names, since the UI is in English. Um, then the locale preferences. And at the bottom, it shows the region formatting uh, based on what the device is set to. Then on Android, we have examples of collation, where these are two images side by side in different languages. And you can tell from the icons how the items are getting reordered based on um, sorting, right? alphabetical sorting. One of the more tricky areas for localization that CLDR supports is plurals. Different languages have very different plural behavior than English. In the first screenshot, you can see the word phi, the word after five, and in the next screenshot, you can see how that changes when it is used in reference to two instead of five. Plural, plurals, genders, and other grammatical features can have a dramatic impact on how natural a language will feel in applications for users. Now let's take a look at how this data is gathered. So we've got a short demo of what's called the survey tool, which is used to gather the data for these different locales. So here's French and some of the core data that we gather is what the characters are used by, uh, what characters are used by each particular language. So these indicate the main letters that are used by French. Uh, we also have other cases, the auxiliary, auxiliary letters, which are used for loan words, they're used for technical usage and so forth, but they're characters that would be fairly 
in fairly common usage, you'd see them in magazines and so forth. And there are a variety of other sets of characters that are important to know about the language. Now, over on the right, we see uh, an info panel. And this is a panel of information that helps the translator go through the process of adding or changing data. And here we see some examples and we see the voting record. In this case, the data has been redacted for this presentation. And we also see what's called a forum and people can make various posts, they can request changes of other people. And this is a mechanism that the translators use to come to consensus about the best choices. And if you look over here, each of these can have multiple choices that are built up during the process of, of uh, coming to the consensus on the best choice to be given. So let's take a look at another tab. Uh, here, for example, we're looking at the name of a country, Bulgaria, in French. And we also supply information for how these things are going to look like in usage. Uh, languages and countries and scripts are used in describing different locales. And so here you see Bulgarian uh, as used in Bul uh, Bulgaria. You see Bulgarian written in Cyrillic, which is normally the default uh, as used in Bulgaria. Or you can see a region Bulgarian. Uh, Bulgaria, sorry. Uh, and once again, you see a, a recording of who voted for what and what the consensus was. Now, right in here, you see the name of the country with the region. This is a little panel that tells you a little bit more about it, and it links to a page that tells you much more about it. So here, for example, this talks about um, the different regions, uh, geopolitically sensitive names or names that are very easily confused. Here's another example of some more complex data. And these are data that are used for uh, intervals of time. In this case, we have an interval of time where the day is the only thing that changes between the start date and the end date. And so you'll see that an abbreviated format can be provided for that, which is much more natural and, and handier if you're using it on a phone or other device with a small amount of screen real estate. So once again, you can see an example of this in usage. So you see how each of these uh, placeholder letters or sequences of letters can be replaced by a month or a day or a year and so forth. So as we look down these, you'll see different examples coming up depending upon what the largest field is uh, that's involved. So when the year changes, then the whole day, uh, date is repeated. So uh, now let's take a look at something even more complicated, and that is units of measurement. So here we have uh, a year. So I have one year, three year, five years. And we have to know what the gender is, uh, how you would display it if you had it in a menu or something like that and then how you would combine it with the number. So here we have one per year, uh, a short form of that. We have 1.5 year, which is how you use plural in French. And you would say 3.5 years and so forth. And it gets even more interesting if we go to Slavic languages, as we touched on earlier, Slavic languages tend to have a lot of different plural forms and they tend to be highly inflected. So for Czech, for example, we're seeing the word for uh, century in lots of different forms because the accusative form is different than the genitive form is different than the locative form. And then this also varies by the plural form. And here again, in the uh, info panel, we see information. And in this case, it's showing us that if I were to put in a different, if I were put in this phrase in a different sentence, then I would actually use a different format for it. 
So it's indicating that this is appropriate for one kind of sentence to put in, but not for another kind of sentence. So how does this all get delivered to products? Well, each of these, uh, each of the languages have multiple files that contain different kinds of information. Uh, if you see here, we're looking at different files that are appropriate for Japanese. And in those files, you'll find some, you'll find date ranges like the ones we just looked at. And in this case, you'll see that uh, in Japanese, uh, a wavy tilde is used instead of a dash to separate a date range. And the thing that ties this all together is the specification, because that tells you how to use this structured data, how it's intended to be used, how you, uh, how you construct the, um, the, for example, the identifiers for units so that you can call a, a programmatic interface to use these to get the kind of usage um, preferences that Anne-Marie referred to earlier. And then finally, there will be a particular release page for each release, and this provides an update on what is new in this release, uh, new languages or extended coverage for those languages, new features. Uh, it also talks about any migration issues from the last release and so forth. And if you're interested in any of this, then you can take a look at the CLDR site. Uh, and look at the download pages, and that gives an overview of what's in each of these releases. A common question that we get is how many languages or locales does CLDR support? And in terms of languages, uh, it really depends upon the level of support that we're looking at. We have 95 languages at a modern level, and this is what's suitable for full internationalization of a user interface and for the data content. Uh, and this has approximately 6,000 to 12,000 data fields, depending upon the locale. Now, when I say language, that means the base language. Uh, there are many different variants of a base language, depending upon which country or, in some cases, which script is concerned. So you get a lot more locales than you actually have languages. The, the second level is called moderate level, and we have currently six languages at the modern level. And this is what's so this level is suitable for document content internationalization. For example, you might be using a spreadsheet in uh, in French or in Spanish or English. UI, but you actually want the content of that spreadsheet to be in HOSA. And so this level provides enough information to do a good job of handling the date formats, time formats, and so forth that you would find in the content of a typical, um, of a typical application. So that somebody, even if they're using an English UI, they can produce a document that is appropriate for a different language. And the third level is basic. And basic only has around 65 different um, fields. Uh, again, it depends a little bit on the locale. And this is level is suitable for locale selection. So it has very basic content uh, some uh, for supporting basic dates and times and so forth. Typically, this is used in, say, selecting a language on a phone where you might say, well, I speak Romansh, but um, I also want to have German in case a particular application on that phone. It doesn't support Romansh, it can support German. So I can pick it so that those applications that do have Romansh can actually display in Romanche, and the other ones will be in another language. The last category here are the other ones that have not yet reached a basic level, and there are about 183 of these. And these are 
uh, typically languages that we call digitally disadvantaged languages. And you'll hear more about that in some of the other presentations. So you may be asking yourself, why should I get involved in CLDR? So one of the top reasons is protecting the investment. Your users rely on a stable, high quality release, and you may need features in that are being developed in CLDR. Next, uh, each release has many choices, features, bugs to fix, languages to focus on. Technical committee members have a voice in what is prioritized for each release. And of course, Many hands make light work. Um, after that, interoperability. You wanna make sure that your users don't have a significantly different experience across platforms. Finally, there are the digitally disadvantaged languages. This CLDR is one of the key ways that languages are then able to have support in software. And so who are we looking for? We're not just looking for coders. We're looking for translators, linguists, and researchers who can either contribute via the survey tool or help resolve other questions that require deep dive research. PMs are, in, are essential for helping with organization, coordination, planning, or prior, and prioritization so that we are able to successfully release twice a year. Tech writers. We have a lot of documentation, both for developers and for the language specialists who are contributing. And somebody needs to translate the programmees into English so that the language specialists understand about the, the data needed for contribution in that release. UI designers can help improve the survey tool usability so that we get high quality data when the language specialists submit it. Finally, of course, we do definitely need coders who have experience in internationalization, localization, and other disciplines, because we do a lot of work with maintaining our database, survey tool, voting, better communication, tests, and building the CLDR features. Thank you. Um, for more information on how to get started or become a member and support Unicode, uh, you should go to the Unicode website at unicode.org. Thank you for your time today.